Dr. Thierry Vrain is a specialist when it comes to food, food supply, the use of glyphosate in our food system, and some potential solutions to how to make things better. We had a wonderful wide-ranging conversation, which I hope you enjoy. If you like the work we do here at the Dentist Support, please share the show, make comments on the show, and support the show through clicking the link on Patreon. And now, Dr. Vrain. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And thank you so much for coming and giving us a, an hour of your time. You have a busy week coming in front of you. Yeah, looking forward to it. Mm. A starting point for the audience probably would be a better understanding of glyphosate. And a better understanding of glyphosate. And what it is. Uh, for New Brunswick's media, yeah. uh, we throw the word, the word is thrown around a lot in the media, and uh, there's an assumed understanding. This would be a chance to maybe deepen that understanding of what it is and its impact. Do you mind sharing with us? No, I don't mind at all. I, uh, I've been very public for the last five years about it. You know, I was a genetic engineer when I finished my career and was intrigued and curious about five, six years ago when I realized, I've retired 12 years ago, realized that there was something wrong with the technology, you know, GMOs, and rats are fed GMOs and they get sick and we're like, what's going on? This is not possible. Mm -hmm. This is a very safe technology, the GMO technology, genetic engineering, and I used to speak publicly about it. And I dug a bit and realized, after a few months, that it had nothing to do with the technology. It was the pesticide that is sprayed on the GMO crops, on the food, that is actually causing the damage. Well, when I became convinced of that, then I became public about it. And I, I was in Nova Scotia four years ago for two weeks, touring about. I mm -hmm. was in Quebec, I was in Ontario. I went, I went all across Canada with my message lecturing about it. And that's why I'm back here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, glyphosate. Well, it's a very tiny molecule that was invented in 1950 created uh, with many, many others, hundreds of other molecules, by a chemist who was looking for for medicinal properties, you know, can we use this molecule for this or that, etc., etc., and they didn't really find, his company didn't really find uh, an, uh, a use for it, so they shelved it. Then it reappeared. It was patented again. Uh, as a demineralizer to clean up boilers and pipes in industry when they boil water 24-7 uh, and the boilers and pipes get coated with minerals and that was used to clean that up. <laughs> when you dispose of the solution that you've made to clean up your boiler and you put it somewhere in nature, in, you know, in the forest or whatever, and my goodness, you realize that you've killed everything. All the plants and all the trees are dead. Well, somebody at Monsanto realized that there was uh, something there. And they patented it very quickly as a herbicide because it is an excellent herbicide. It kills plants, <laughs> all of them. <laughs> and then they made it into a roundup. It took them five years to do all kinds of studies and realize what they could do with it and blah, blah, blah. Mm. And it became roundup. And it is an excellent herbicide. It's used in forestry. It's used to, you know, control invasives. It's used in agriculture. It's used in gardens. It's used everywhere, really. Mm. And then, and that's where I uh, say the buck stops here. Mm. Then in 1996, uh, Monsanto introduced GMO crops hmm. that could be sprayed with it because that's what they engineered. They engineered basically tolerance to the herbicide. And so now you can spray soybean and corn. You can spray all the big crops, sugar beet, canola, hmm. cotton, and a few others. So it came into your food because if you use it as a herbicide, the residues in the soil that are picked up by uh, the crop to come are kind of minimum. And, um, yeah, you know, it's 
that chemical. I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. But the residues are really small, and compared to all the other herbicides, really, it's no worse. Yeah. Yeah. But to spray it on the food, that's a new one. That's a different one. That's, that's, that's like it's uh, with, with when I past a threshold here. Yeah, when I started to prep for our interview and reading some of the material, it made me think of uh, another era in DDT. And the use of DDT being sprayed on, on food and then the testing tended to come after. It's like the testing process is, let's see if this does the job we think it's going to do. And then 10 or 15 or 20 years later, it's like, oh, here's these other related consequences to it. But you have to work twice as hard, kind of backwards, to show the direct causal link. Yeah, there's some analogy with DDT in terms of spray spread on the food. But DDT was a very uh, specific insecticide. Mm -hmm. This is spread all over okay. it's it's yeah the contamination of the food supply of glyphosate and DDT really is not comparable okay good not comparable at all good not only that but with the <laughs> with the spraying of the crops the food crops in from 1996 and very soon after of a lot of other crops which are sprayed just before harvest now this is something most people don't know all the grain crops and all the seed crops are sprayed just before harvest so of course the residues are maximum yeah, they're at peak at that point mm -hmm. they're at peak at that point yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so when i say grain and seed crops i mean wheat mm -hmm. barley rye triticale etc uh it's called it's called desiccation it's called chemical ripening um mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So basically, you could spray it on your plate because really, you know, the weed that is in your loaf of bread was harvested two weeks ago, could be six months ago, but it really makes no difference. There's mm -hmm. no, no difference. No expiry date on it. No. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's sprayed in the water for to control invasive weeds mm -hmm. in the water, which are annoying. It's sprayed in the forest, of course. It's sprayed in your garden. People mm -hmm. use it. It's sprayed on your driveway because, you know, there's weeds everywhere. And this is stuff is really, really working. Mm -hmm. It's not like it kind of controls some of the weeds. It controls all the weeds all the time. It really works. So you've mapped out well how pervasive the use of glyphosate is. Yeah. <clears throat> is there any <clears throat> question as to... Uh, so where I want to go is common sense, and I'm thinking of the audience as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, what's the problem then if someone's approved it? Yep. So, can you wander us into maybe that approval process and, and deepen the understanding that, yes, it's per used in many, many places with much consequence, uh, and then map out what the, risk, what the risk is? Glyphosate has now officially become the most successful commercial agricultural chemical, okay? It's not like a pesticide or a herbicide, agricultural chemical ever. Mm -hmm. It's everywhere. Okay, it's in. They, they they tested it, and it's uh, and accordingly they did their test. I think somewhere in the in the USA, probably where it's used a lot in agriculture. Hmm. But if, I don't remember the numbers, but they found it like in ninety percent of the air samples, air sample is breathing, water everywhere in the water, and of course it's in the soil, and then of course it's in the food crops. Yes, hmm. yeah. So that was several years ago, and I don't think it's any different. It's probably worse because the use of glyphosate is going exponentially. It's just incredible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so let's talk about effects, toxicity. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of scientific publications that have come out in the last 10 to 20 years, particularly in the last five years. Much of it in Europe, but now all kinds of governments are actually very interested in it because it's we're repeating basically the tobacco crisis of 40 years ago. And the industry is saying, there's nothing wrong with it. You know, there's 29,000 doctors who are saying, you know, you can smoke this one instead of this one because it's better, it's easier. Wow. And now, 40 years later, we look back and say, yeah, yeah, it does definitely causes lung cancer and as well as all kinds of other cancers. And it's only when the social cost became so high 
Uh, the government stepped in and said, yeah, okay, enough. Yeah, we can't, we can't bear this. It's, it's getting too expensive. Mm -hmm. There's too many people coming down with cancer and the health system is getting bogged down. So you see a similar potential pattern with glyphosate? I do. Okay. Very much so. Yeah. When I say I, I don't mean I. I mean a lot of people are, are seeing it. It's a lot. It's many, many billions of dollars of revenue for this very large chemical corporation. So you bet they are fighting it. Mm -hmm. Of course. They're fighting it here and there and everywhere. And, it's, and they're very powerful. And they have a lot of money. And they can allow, they can afford the best um, advertising people. They can afford. Sure. They, they can. can they can bring all their weight to bear. Absolutely. <clears throat> they can fight it in the court. They can. Yeah. <clears throat> there are close to 300 uh, law uh, suits now in the USA from people, mostly with cancer, saying this caused my cancer because I am not using any other chemical and I've used glyphosate because I've been told it was so safe and you know I'm a farmer I'm farming uh, coffee in Hawaii and I have never been exposed to any kind of except we use this 10 years later I have cancer my wife has cancer people around me have cancer and I'm suing because I've been told it was so safe and yeah. I've been told I don't need to so are, are you able to tell us if those people in their lawsuit are able to draw a direct link between glyphosate, Roundup, mm -hmm. and... Okay. So well, they, they, I mean, they do, because that's basically the only chemical they've ever used. Okay. And they come to that, and then you go and you look at the literature and say, ah... So there are cases that directly link one with the other? With, well, with there's a chemical with that major outcome. law firms in the USA right now that are involved in these lawsuits and they're working together and they're combing the literature and they say there's so much evidence okay. which is why most if not all of the European government have said okay enough we don't want it here because we've done our homework we've done our uh, research okay. and yeah it definitely is a, a cancer causing agent. Do you have a sense of which countries have um, banned glyphosate? France, Germany, Austria. I don't. Yeah, there might be more, but oh, there's many more. Yeah. I don't mm -hmm. keep track of uh, uh, yeah. of them. As is, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Why I asked that in yes. part was was because um, in the social media world, and especially with the recent American election, yeah. the whole issue of finding information you can trust mm -hmm. is a challenge. Mm -hmm. So in the social media world, there'll be um, some radical activist groups mm -hmm. that'll crank a lot of information out on a whole series of topics and build large petitions. There'll be industry that crank out a whole lot of information, uh, counter information. Um, we yeah. now have a, a long running narrative on climate change yeah. and what Exxon spent in the mid 70s to deny climate change and the groups that they funded to present counterpoints. So we're at a unique moment in time with all of the tools we have to bear and all of the knowledge we have to bear and we don't seem as a society or a community to know how to get our feet on the ground to make a solid decision based on solid information without it being opinion or so that we can actually move forward. So is this another one of those mm -hmm. that's going to get caught up in that chaos of communication? It's definitely been caught up for years mm -hmm. in that kind of thing. Because really, if I'm a very large corporation, mm. we have a lot of money. Mm. And there is a scientist somewhere in Thailand or even Europe or France who comes up with a study saying it could be a short study or it could be a very long-term study saying, okay, there's dangers here. We have shown there is science with good statistical analysis showing that, yeah, this is definitely dangerous. It does cause cancer. Hmm. Well, if I'm that large corporation, say, oh, okay, we need a study right now. Right now, we need a study showing that, no, it doesn't cause cancer. Can you find some scientists for hire? Uh, we don't have, you know, we don't spend a lot of money on it, but we can. Find me some scientists for hire that will sign a ghost-written study showing that it is not 
causing mm. cancer. Mm. Yes, sir. Uh, okay, three months later, boom, here is a study. Yeah. Ghost written by people at Monsanto, signed by Professor Chassis or this or that or the name, yeah. etc., who have worked with Monsanto for years. Yeah. This is here. Ah, okay, go ahead. This is a new book. Yeah. It came out two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Okay, written for the last several years by an investigative journalist called Carrie Gillam, who has written the story. I don't think she's biased, necessarily. She's just common sense. You, you used that word earlier. Yeah. And voila. So Good. it's here, it's just out, and you can uh, refer to it later if you want. Great. It's called The Story of a Weed Killer cancer and the corruption of science mm. and that's well that's one of the directions I wanted to explore yes. the corruption of science mindset because there was a time when if it was scientifically proven it was treated as solid and you could move forward mm -hmm. but that was maybe 40 50 years ago now mm -hmm. um, it seems that that narrative and that conversation has eroded over time and now people don't trust anything mm -hmm. and you can zero sum any conversation just by presenting an opposite set of facts Absolutely. and you're stuck. So for me the real quandary is how do we move forward because we have to start moving forward on so many different fronts yeah. and, it, and science seems you know the, the positivistic approach to science where here I've done this you take my criteria and methods you can recreate it you can create recreate it and suddenly we treat this as true or accurate or fact mm -hmm. That's, you've just shared a story, well, yeah, we can look at it this way and come up with this result and this way and this result, and it's zero sums. And then you have fear, and then you've got a, a whole population sitting still. Yeah. And in, <laughs> immobilized and afraid, and people say, oh, I wonder if the food system is corrupted, contaminated. Uh, this woman, um, and she's basically a, a mouthpiece for an organization called the U.S. Right to Know. You, you said you wanted to put a few links. Yeah. You will look for U.S. Right to Know and all the information that is coming out. Because I was telling you that almost 300 lawsuits in the U.S. Yeah. and some of the judges have allowed to a lot of documents, a lot of um, email exchanges a lot of information that Monsanto has insisted over the years, over the last 20 to 40 years, must be remaining secret yeah, and because they are private, because they are, um, what's the term, confidential yeah. documents? Yeah, proprietary. Yeah, proprietary, thank you. And the judges have said, yeah, well, these and these and these can be made public. For public domain. So they are all listed and there are like thousands and tens of thousands of pages of mm. that documentation mm. in the US Right to Know website. Mm. And she mentions it and I've looked there and thought, wow, yeah. what a trove. Yeah. It's amazing. And even this woman, I was going to say young woman because I'm 71 <laughs> and she probably looks like she's 40 or something who was a journalist for writer, that's his career. Yeah. And then she kind of left that and then she went to and decided to write his book a few years back. Her focus. And it's thing. all all this documentation is listed there. And even her who says that, you know, after dealing with all this, she's pretty she calls herself a cynic, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. But she went, Oh my God. Mm -hmm. Because it's all there. Yeah. The email is saying what I was describing to you earlier about this you know, uh, rich corporation who can rewrite science because, okay, we need a ghostwriting, yeah, every time they do that. Mm -hmm. And she discovered that. So in your tour of New Brunswick, and you, and you bring this message through the province, and is it more than just the use of glyphosate? It, can you offer suggestions about where New Brunswick could be going? Are, are you... Have the gang that have brought you here brought you up to speed about um, Irving Industries and their use of glyphosate and the yes. ongoing conversation in New Brunswick about the, th the product? Yeah, uh, Caroline uh, Luby Darcy, Dr. Caroline Luby Darcy, yeah. uh, you know, asked me if I would come and I said yes, but you know, I'm completely ignorant about forestry practices, 
about what's happening in New Brunswick. She said, well, you come. Yeah. Okay. My Same product, though. presentation is about glyphosate being sprayed on agricultural crops, yeah. meaning food. I am really concerned about the contamination of the food supply. Mm -hmm. And that's what I talk about. Mm -hmm. So if you can take that and translate it into, you know, what's happening in New Brunswick and the forestry is being sp and the forest is being sprayed, and there are food products in the forest, but it's beyond that, really. Yeah. Well, it's just about the principle of how do you keep a healthy planet. How do you keep a healthy planet? Mm -hmm. Now. One thing that most people don't pay attention to, certainly, of course, we can talk about PMRA, we can talk about Health Canada, we can talk about you know these regulatory agencies, if you want, yeah. in a minute. But one thing that they ignore, and most people don't know, is that this chemical was for, from a demineralizer. It was patented as a herbicide and then it has a long career as a herbicide, and then it's the GMOs, and then it's the um, chemical ripening thing. Well, in 2001, Monsanto filed to the U.S. Bureau of Patents for glyphosate as a anti-parasitic agent because it kills the malaria agent which is a unicellular flagellate organism. Well, no wonder. It's the same um, biochemical pathway that it kills plants. Okay. And it's the same biochemical pathway in bacteria. Bacteria make their proteins in the same way that plants do in the same way that the malaria agent do, in the same way that many, many unicellular organisms do. It's called a, a shikimat pathway. That's how they make their proteins. If you can't make your proteins, you're mm. done. Mm. Okay. We, humans, animals, do not have that biochemical pathway. That's why half of our half of our amino acids must come from our food because we don't know how to make that. We don't have the biochemistry to do that. Sometimes I say, yeah, animals are kind of dumb. Animals are dwarfs, mm. biochemically speaking, because mm. we can't do that. We need it in our food. Mm. Bacteria killed the same way plants are. It is an antibiotic. Mm. So this molecule is a patented antibiotic. And y if you read this, you will see that I call it an antibiotic masquerading as a herbicide. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it is antibiotic. Now, what the consequences would be of that? Mm. Okay, well, I mean, the whole food chain in the soil relies on bacteria. That's the first chain, mm. the first uh, step in the chain. We animals are symbiotic organisms. We have, all of us, humans and all animals, have in our uh, digestive food tract, in digestive thing, we have a, what, an organ called a microbiome. Mm -hmm. Do you know any of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Vaguely, Mac yeah, okay. layman version. In French, microbiote. Mm -hmm. The microbiome, a hundred trillion bacteria in our gut. Mm -hmm. well, what, what are they doing there? Mm -hmm. Well, they are actually influencing, if you don't like the word controlling, mm -hmm. practically all our internal organs. Mm -hmm. Okay, The microbiome is in charge of our health, period. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. The medical establishment has gone crazy over the last five years to show that the microbiome is in charge of your heart, of your brain, of your immune system. 100% of your immune system is influenced, controlled by your microbiome. So if there is a residue of antibiotic in your food every day, your bread is contaminated heavily. 
your all your grains are contaminated all your seeds are contaminated beans chickpeas peas mm. uh, sunflower hemp etc 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 because they're all sprayed just before harvest it's normal it's routine so you are ingesting <coughs> small or not so small residues of antibiotic in your food every day and what could be the consequences of that The consequences of that would be a damaged microbiome. Mm. And if your microbiome is not healthy, is not happy, well, your other organs might not be mm. healthy or happy. Mm. And we don't have the studies showing that. We only have correlation studies, not causation studies. But, you know, I don't think it's difficult to make the step and show, yeah, Cancer, yeah. autism, Alzheimer, obesity, and on and on and on. Because because this is such an important super organ. This is what yep. this is what the medical establishment is telling <coughs> us for the last few years. It's it's recent, but yep. they're going nuts. They said, like, "Oh my God, look yep. at that! This is a super organ, and we didn't know we had." Yep. In it, in in other areas like um. It'll sound odd, but the soul or the spirit, um, stuff that Mr. Chopra, Deepak Chopra, might um, talk about with uh, reinventing, bo reinventing the body, resurrecting the soul, um, the connection between science, the body, and the spirit, because um, it all lives in your gut. Because there's more and more science now validating what others might have known from another pathway to about who we are and our essence and how much our well-being is connected to our gut, not just physically, but also emotionally and spiritually, which you're also touching on the same, the same themes. This is fascinating, because I was just on the phone an hour ago with a, I'm not sure where he was or who he was, a, a journalist or something, and I, it was very brief, like five minutes. So we talk about glyphosate, and then I talk microbiome. No, I don't know what that is, so I explained to one microbiome. Oh, oh okay, well, <coughs> thank you, bye. <laughs> yeah, but it's but it's about our soul. It, it wouldn't be that hard this of a here, step. This here has been considered in our culture hmm. and in practically all other culture as the center hmm. of our body. Hmm. This is this is who we are. This is our center. Yeah. Yes, we do have another brain up there, but it's taking yeah. care of our movement. Yeah. Oh, there's food over there, and yeah. that's where the brain... You know, this is basically sure. the coordinating all your senses. Yeah, the conscious or the first layer, sort of. And then, and the heart is 50 times more powerful in its awareness than the brain is in its yeah. levels of awareness. Yeah. And now we're starting to learn the gut's levels of awareness, which connects to a much bigger sphere. This is where your creativity comes from. This is where a lot comes from. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do we get the message out about glyphosate? I, I still want to go back and go... So this product was approved. We can imagine whatever lobbying was involved w with it and whatever pushing the social narrative was involved with it. Um, and then over time, accumulation of knowledge and experience and common sense <laughs> starts to surface. And maybe this isn't such a good thing. Um, but I still want to go back to, so how do we trust it? How, I almost want to go, do we trust it because our gut tells us, <laughs> you know, to make the connection back? Because somewhere out there, people will want to have some control over their lives again and not feel so inundated with, you know, I'm supposed to do it this way, I'm supposed to do it that way. They'll just want to get on with what they need to do. But to do that, they'll need to find a, a grounding or a source that helps them. Do you, do you have a way to help them with that? Like to grow your own food, um, read labels, those kind of practical applications? I arrived last night from home on Vancouver Island and my host is a wonderful woman and she served me breakfast this morning and there is organic yogurt why organic yogurt I'm not sure but I said you know my talk my presentation I'm here to talk about contamination of the food supply mm. and I can assure you that in the bread here there's a huge amount of glyphosate. And it doesn't matter if it has a big non-GMO sticker because that's completely meaningless. Wheat is not a GMO crop. Yeah. 
<laughs> and so I, you know, I say, I, I think it's important. I think you should, you know, pay attention to that. And she says, well, you know, I'm, I'm my kids, my, I'm old, I, I, I'm interested in glyphosate in the forest, and I respect that. But I really, really, really want to push that thing about the whole food supply is contaminated. Hmm. Wheat, corn, and soy are, you know, basically the basic of, of all your calories. Yep. Um. And then, what do you feed your animals, you know, if you're not vegetarian? Yep. Wheat, yep. soy, and corn. Yep. And they're all sprayed. And your meat and your dairy and your eggs are all contaminated heavily enough that 10 years later people come down with these chronic diseases that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. so. The rise of celiac disease, does it connect to the wheat element? Because we often hear that story but they don't work at the next layer back to glyphosate or contaminated crops. Celiac is an autoimmune dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you that if your bi microbiome is damaged, you have autoimmune disease mm -hmm. after a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you want to, I'll give you uh, the last five minutes of my talk, my presentation, which I keep for the end. Glyphosate was invented in 1950 as an amino acid analog. Mm -hmm. I even see that in a government document. It's an amino acid analog, for God's sake. You know, it's an amino acid analog. It's, it's, it's amino acid. It's part of your protein. Yeah. Oh, you mean it's part of your proteins? That's interesting. All right. So I looked into that, and there's definitely scientific evidence, quite a bit, showing that yes, it is incorporated into your protein if. Glyphosate is glycine, um, glycine methyl phosphonate, glyphosate, glycine methyl phosphonate. It's a glycine analog. Glycine is a two carbon amino acid. It's the smallest amino acid we, uh, we use okay. in our, um, in our, to make up our proteins. It's the same thing for plants, animals, bacteria, all living organisms use glycine as an amino acid. And not only that, but it's a major amino acid because it's so small that it's important where the protein can fold, if, if you know a bit of biochemistry. Okay. So, your metabolism, to call it this way, uh, the, the, the machinery to make proteins in your cells does not make the difference between glycine and glycine methyl phosphonate. Hmm. Oh. So, if there is glyphosate, in your cells, in your organs, in your body, then it is actually incorporated into the protein. And if it is incorporated into the protein, well, it's not quite the same. It's like basically glycine with a small tail. But the protein doesn't work as well as it should. Or maybe not at all if the, uh, I mean, the analog was incorporated right at the center where it's working. And if your proteins don't work, your cells don't work. And if your cells don't work, your organs don't work. And if your organs don't work well, you come down with a chronic disease. It's Back to food supply. Yes. <clears throat> um, New Brunswick um, is struggling with trying to create a food security strategy. Um, it's hard to get it uh, top of the agenda or even anywhere on the agenda for some people. Um, and yet, maybe there's a window for a little province like New Brunswick with a lot of farmland, and an abandoned farmland, to make a leap forward um, to bypass running into those obstacles. Um, and then generating a food supply that's free of glyphosate, although with all the spraying going on in the forestry, it might be a challenge to find the space where that can happen. I just wonder if food and the awareness of glyphosate becomes a place for New Brunswick to move forward with a food strategy that gets them ahead of the other places now having to clean up their food supply. Oh, I, I, you know, I would share your dream. I mean, 
I don't think it's difficult to imagine that one year from now or five years from now the spraying of the forest will be an old thing because this thing is going to explode mm -hmm. very soon, mm -hmm. very quickly. This book is remarkable. This is, this is a sequel to Silent Spring, in my view. Okay. So, okay. It's, big. it's going to become popular. People will go, oh my God, mm -hmm. really? So, imagine if uh, New Brunswick, a small province, would go organic. Mm -hmm. There's a, you know, this is what Russia is doing. Okay. Russia, two years ago, mm, Mr. Putin decided, okay, well, we're going to... Do it our own way. We're going, we're going to do it our own way. We're going to keep GMOs and glyphosate out of the country, and we're going to grow organic food for the European market. Mm -hmm. Well, they seem to be very, very popular right now, because the Europeans are clamoring for organic food. How about food production in China? Are you aware of, of their use of glyphosate over in China or other I, things from food I'm supply? I'm not. All I know okay. is that they manufacture 80% of it Yeah, and yeah. are happy to sell it yeah, to wherever it goes. You know, making a buck is important or making a yuan or whatever, yeah. since they're coming off <coughs> yeah, okay. the dollar. Um, do you have Canadian examples of awareness of this and shifts in strategies or government I policy? I do not know. Okay. No, I don't. It might be right at the front end of that curve. Yes, I am enthusiastic. I'm very optimistic that this thing is going to explode very soon, very quickly. I have no idea if Bayer is going to steal by Monsanto or not, or yes. <coughs> and by the way, Bayer has the same product. They call it glyphosinate. Hmm. It's an antibiotic. Oh, but it's... It, it's um, natural. It's mm -hmm. made by a fungus. Yeah. But it is antibiotic and it works exactly like glyphosate. Mm. Yeah. Do you find it hard to get a complex message across in, a, in simple terms for people? Because you're doing a nice job of dancing us between science and in letting, letting me grasp you know, more or less the gist of what you're saying. Because you find there's an accuracy and uh, one of those foundation pieces that I keep talking about that we can trust that and push off from it. Mm. What's that like for you to try to communicate? Um, I don't find it difficult. You know, I'm, I'm an aging scientist. It's a long time since I was in science. If you ask, if I was in conversation with a, a graduate student, he could just uh, destroy me because I don't remember the details anymore. Plus, I'm <laughs> halfway to Alzheimer, of course. At my age, I'm losing my memory. But so it's, I find it re rewarding to be able to translate technical science into a c conversational uh, piece mm -hmm. where I can really tell people, look, you know, it's not a question of trust. You can go and check, check it up, check it out. But really, you need to pay attention here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have you had the opportunity to share this with uh, politicians or policymakers? Um, <sighs> a few, a few, yeah. And how does how does that go after a big sigh? <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't go. It it's you know, because because PMRA, because Health Canada says, look, this stuff is good, this stuff is innocuous, okay, get off it. Hmm. Yeah. I um three years ago I presented this lecture, my lecture to the Department of Gastroenterology at the University of British Columbia. The wife of the chairman had attended one of my lectures previously and thought it was important and convinced him that I should present, and so I did. Mm. So I found myself in a large room with all kinds of doctors and surgeons, some of them my age or almost, and, and a lot of young ones, and I presented. And then we had, they had organized a big dinner after that, and so we had dinner. and half a dozen of us at the table, aging surgeons, etc. They were lovely, they were delightful. And one of them went circulate around and talked to the young crowds and someone and came back and said, they think you're biased. Okay, well I'm presenting science. Yeah. I'm presenting data, I'm presenting, you know. And I just couldn't get it. Yeah. And it took me a while, weeks, months, Oh, but they're young. They're a million dollar in debt. It cost me. It cost them that much to be in, you know, to be in medical school for ten years. Mm -hmm. And here comes this guy saying, 
your clientele is about to shrink because all these epidemics of cancer and all this gastrointestinal stuff is caused by this chemical. Mm -hmm. And so they were not really pleased to hear me, to hear my message saying that this is causing that and therefore we get rid of it and then you won't have a job. Interesting, eh? Humans? So, yeah, politicians, you know, what are we going to do? Yeah. What am I saying? I'm saying this stuff is deadly. Yeah. Get rid of it. Yeah. And go back to agriculture where the way we used to do it 50 years ago. And, and there'll be those that'll say you can't sustain the supply needed. And there'll be other ones that say that model will work. Yeah. Because we've gotten so used to agribusiness yeah. and distribution mechanisms a certain way that we've forgotten the way it used to be. And the world's population can still double and we'll still be able to <coughs> feed it. Because there's efficiencies now with some technology that you can get a different yield from a hectare that you used to 50 years ago. Yeah. So politicians are difficult. Mm because they have a job to do, you know, they have to keep basically the system as it's running because it's pretty good. Cheap is food, sorry, food is cheap, Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you, yeah. Interesting. Food's one of those ones that it connects all of us. It's one of, it's just like air, land, water, food, and yet it'll show where our gaps are. <laughs> But between each other about what the best approach is. And we've lost the ability to communicate differences. We, yeah. we want to entrench and be somewhat tribal about differences and want to win rather than, oh, why is it um, that your point of view created in that younger audience a sense of risk rather mm -hmm. than, oh, investigation and query used to invite constant rehashing of the premise, if that makes sense. We don't have much of a food culture in North America compared to Europe or China or many other places. Food is, you know, fuel, yeah. really. I mean, you don't have, you know, <laughs> I was raised in France and the conversation at the table when we had guests was yeah. about food, for yeah. God's sake. You know, remember the melon last year? Oh, that was a good yeah. melon. Yeah. I mean, you don't do that here. Uh, there's a scene in a movie called The Red Violin, but the original Red Violin, where they have a meal outdoors and there's about 20 people sitting underneath the tree with some yeah. lights. But it's not done Hollywood style, it's very much French style. And I thought, oh, what a meal to be at, because it's a cultural moment and yeah. it's a cohesive moment. Yeah. It's a spiritual moment oh, yeah. compared to just, okay, I've eaten, throw my stuff in the trash, drive the car I'm to the next place. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I do that every day at my farm. I have a small group of young people who are learning from my wife and myself. I am the cook, and every day at lunch we have this big table. We have, you know, 8 to 10, 12 people, mm -hmm. and we have this communal meal, mm. and the food is good yeah. and organic. Yeah. yeah. And is it fun? It's. <laughs> I, 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 hear, I hear the feedback. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. They love it. They look forward to it. It's there. It's the time of the day to okay. get together. It's exactly what you just said. Yeah. I guessed on the show two years ago, Levi Lawrence, who now is with um, Locavore, uh, local yeah. food movement and uh, food products, but all locally grown and produced and all organic. When Levi was running Real Food Connections, near the end of the interview, he got quite animated, and he's leaning forward and he's going, there's a whole bunch of social ills that we could fix if we just spent more time on our food and eating together. It would take care of this, and he starts rhyming off all these social things. All could be solved just by coming together and sharing a meal. We have forgotten the power of food and the importance of food. It's exactly what you said, air, water, food. I mean, in a lot of countries, people spend a lot of time gathering their food, you know, mm -hmm. and we just completely forgotten about it. So that gets into how do we help change the narrative? Because uh, related conversation with a person who is in charge of uh, our regional health authority. This is two years ago. And I asked the obvious question, Gary, wouldn't it save health industry a lot of money if people just took care of themselves a bit better? Wouldn't that be the shortest route to trying to reduce health care costs as the number one part of our provincial budget every year. 
<laughs> and he kind of smiled because it's so obvious, but that begged the next question is how do we get people to change and recognize they already have the authority and the power to go ahead and do that, which gets to how they buy their groceries or it gets to how they feed themselves or how they build their culture around food. And where do people buy their groceries? They buy their groceries. I've noticed that in the last 10 to 20 years, this is a very strange uh, phenomenon. People buy their groceries, groceries mostly in a large store. Mm -hmm. And now there's a pharmacy in the large store. That didn't happen before. That's new. And what does the pharmacy do? Mm -hmm. The pharmacy peddles pills for your ills mm -hmm. because your food is toxic. I want to interrupt you. So what do you think about Amazon? Because Amazon's all through the news these days about totally <laughs> changing the food, you know, our access to food. Yeah. 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 And I, I mean, I know there's a controversy, but I don't really, I haven't delved into it. Yeah, okay. Know. Well, we can only take on so much. So much, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've noticed I have a cause and I'm being bombarded with other causes. Do this, do that. Ah. These petitions. Ah. Yeah, but that's because you're talking about food exactly. and food connects everybody all the time yeah. culture shifts the chemical corporations are in my view very closely related to the pharmaceutical corporations because they're chemical industries too mm -hmm. and um, you know here is your poison and here is your pills and yeah. Monsanto and the use of glyphosate and genetically modified uh, crops but tied to all that is this because we were talking about food supply and was the notion that they own it it's proprietary um, do you have some thoughts on that because you, you kind of want to go what was the government thinking and then we can fill in our own answer that the thought that you could own you could own a own corn it's like saying you can own air or you, and they can trace it right back to, uh, if I use the word correctly, to a genome. You know, they can, mm -hmm. it's like having a barcode it's on a it. <laughs> proprietary, yeah. So uh, one of the things we have to unlock is the sense of ownership <coughs> of it? I'm not sure how to do that. I, it's not my field at all, but it, I mentioned it in my, uh, in my um, chapter there. Canola uh, comes from a plant called rape. Mm -hmm. And rape was completely inedible. Rape was toxic. Rape, you could extract um, oil from rape and use it for industrial, for paint, for uh, industrial things. But definitely nothing to do with food. But it was pretty close to food. Mm. And how do we bring it to become food and call it canola? There's a whole team of breeders from Alberta who worked for 20 years to breed a new crop from that plant that was not edible by breeding out some of the fatty acid like erucic acid which is toxic hmm. and they did and they, and they managed to do that and canola is not toxic anymore canola is obviously a, a food crop and it was definitely created by the government of canada which is called why well, it's called canola and Monsanto comes behind that and says, oh, well, let's put a gene in there. And say, oh, now it belongs to us. Yeah. So this crop that was created by so much work and your tax dollars and mine for uh, many, many, many years has now become owned by Monsanto. Just that. Hmm. The farmers who don't even realize it because it's normal, it's, it's how farming is done this year, this time, is are become sharecroppers. They are not growing their crops and they are not using, they are growing the crops that they are given and they are using the chemicals that they are given and they get the price that they are given. Yep. The chemical industry owns the food supply. Most of it. Yeah. And most people aren't aware of that to that degree. They are aware of when they go in the grocery store. So part of the exercise is creating that greater awareness or enlightenment for people, yeah. which is your, your tour as part of it. Um, yeah, I hope to, you know, I, uh, awareness is a good word. I hope to create a buzz. It's nothing personal. Yes, I have an ego like everybody else, but it's like, I'm, yeah, I've been concerned for 
too long. And, you know, one question that a lot of people ask me is, well, what can I eat? Yeah. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, I don't know how to answer that other than say, okay, well, let's look at what do I eat, because I have changed my diet. Hmm. Yeah. I have noticed, you know, five, ten years ago, it's like, okay, GMOs, but, but GMOs are not about protein, so it's okay. Like canola oil, for example, should be okay. Because if it is toxic and it's the genetic engineering technology that is a problem, then it should be about proteins. So anything to do with oil is okay. But I've changed my tune because now I realize it is the pesticide contamination. So basically, with what I know, all grains and seeds in my house, and this is what I feed people in my house, in my farm, must be organic. Mm. I, I absolutely request that they haven't been sprayed. Mm. And vegetables and fruits cannot be sprayed, mm. because otherwise you kill them, you know, you kill them. Yeah. So I, I know they're sprayed with all kinds of other toxic molecules and neurotoxins, etc. But somehow it's not it's not the same as what happens here. Yep. So I am not so demanding on that. Yeah, some of the vegetables and some of the fruit I buy are organic and some are not. And I know there's a dozen, dirty dozens and stuff, but I don't really pay too much attention to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts about water? Because that definitely connects to food and definitely connects to spraying. I'm very privileged, again, to go back to the answer I just gave you. I'm very privileged to live in an area where there's hardly any farming, so I'm, yeah. I'm okay. Yes, the forest is sprayed where I live, and yes, there's the watershed, and which is exactly the same problem that we were discussing this morning with my host. Mm. Um, yeah, the watershed. And I'm, that was one of the questions. Are you testing for your water? Mm -hmm. I think... I think a lot of people, it's not cheap, but I think a lot of people should be more and more interested in testing their food and their water and, and their urine. Uh, yeah. Yep. This, is, this is important. Good. A lot of people, you know, when I say, well, you know, eat organic, oh, well, we can't afford it. It's, it's double the price. Yes, it is. It's double the price. Yes, and? What about your car, and your TV, and your holiday, and your lifestyle? Is there no way you could double the price of your food and kind of fit it in your life? Because this is really about food. Yep. This is your health, okay? It's gonna cost you so much in money, and discomfort, and anxiety, and scared, and feared, and stuff when you come down with one of those chronic diseases. Yep. Why not? Why not spend a little bit more money right now and put your, you know, put your money where your, where, where it should be? I mean, we are what we eat. That's you know? one of those narrative shifts that needs to happen. We need to keep nurturing it to happen. Um, in social media, sometimes you'll see a, it's called Pinterest. So it's a picture mm. and then some words put over top. So why is it people will pay $5.50 for their fancy coffee, but they don't want to spend the $5.50 on some organic food? Yeah, so the resources are there. It's about making a choice. You and know why? <laughs> because that's what they see on TV. Oh, the the television <laughs> is the incredible brainwash yeah. uh, thing. You know? And I haven't had a TV in my home for uh, 30 years. And there. So if you were to watch, and you were to watch all the commercials around food, it, it's very possible you'd be thinking not a single food commercial was actually had food in it. They're all food products. It's quite constant. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the other piece around social media and buying organic um, is that the food quality that you get with organic means you can actually eat less. So you're more satisfied with the meal you eat. Do you have thoughts about that? Um, um, yeah, I suppose. I definitely know that the... USDA, I don't know about Canada, but I definitely know the numbers in the USDA. They they've, they've sample food, you know, every year for the last 50 years or so, and they can show that the mineral content is going down mm -hmm. significantly. And, and vitamin C and a few other molecules, etc. But the minerals are going down. What are the minerals doing 
why do we need minerals? And that's what I teach to my students. The minerals are just as essential as proteins mm -hmm. because they work together. The minerals are the cofactors of the protein. The proteins don't work without those minerals. The, a protein molecule literally needs an atom of magnesium or manganese <laughs> or iron. I mean, yeah. you know, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin without iron doesn't work. Yep. And that's, we need the minerals. And as you just rightly pointed out, the mineral content is much higher in organic because that's, it has to do with, it has to do with where the food comes from and how it's grown. Hmm. Yeah. We have about two minutes left. How would you like to send us out? Final thoughts, final message? <sighs> pay, atten pay attention to what you eat. You are what you eat and pay attention to what you put in your mouth because when every morsel you put in your, in your mouth goes to feed your microbiome first, you're feeding your bacteria and then your bacteria feed you. So take care of your friends. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Wonderful interview. Thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon. Patreon.